ان الحمد لله ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا وسيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وسلم يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارحام ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار my brothers and sisters when we start discussing the topic of the shaytan a being who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in the Quran over and over and over again a being whom we have been taught to seek refuge from and as a matter of fact if you want to look at the importance of this topic all you have to know and understand is that we are instructed that before we even access the guidance of the Quran we seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the shaytan this is why we say a'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim before we even reciting the Quran how important must this topic be and how much is this topic of the shaytan belittled my brothers and sisters Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala referred to the shaytan as the enemy of mankind inna shaytana lakum adu most certainly the shaytan is an enemy for you fattakhiduhu aduwa so take him as your enemy and i know a lot of times when we think about the concept of the shaytan or the shaytan it's almost as if it's a figure or a being or something that is there and it's it's just this conceptual idea it has no effect in our lives but if you go back to revelation if you go back to the quran and the sunna you will find that indeed this shaytan has a role to play in our lives and that is why we actively seek to protect ourselves from the influence of the shaytan and the battleground of the shaytan the place where the shaytan wages the most severe war is not in a physical place outside it is upon our hearts it is our hearts that are at stake and a lot of times this battle with the shaytan is a personal battle and the effects of a losing war against the shaytan they manifest themselves upon our actions that is why the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam mentioned this to us the importance of the heart in our lives he said sallallahu alaihi wasallam ala inna fil jasad mudgha idha salahat salah al jasad kullu he said most certainly in the body there is a morsel of flesh or a piece of flesh if it is sound if it's doing okay if it's doing well then the rest of the body will be well the rest of the body will be okay wa idha fasadat however if it is ruined if it is diseased if it's messed up fasad al jasad kullu the rest of the body will be diseased and messed up as well and that is why a lot of times we look at religiosity we look at being a practicing muslim simply in terms of physical actions we look at being religious or pious simply in terms of well how many times do you pray do you fulfill your prayer requirements of prayer do you fast and do you give charity and that's it and no doubt that is an important part of our deen that is an important part of our spirituality but my brothers and sisters without the heart without the presence of the heart without the heart being involved in those matters those things remain 
simply as rituals. You know the thing about rituals is? Every religion has rituals. Every way of life has rituals. How much do they benefit people? We don't want our religion, our deen, to become a deen of empty rituals. We want a deen that brings together the external rituals and the spirituality of our hearts as well. And the shaitan knows that. And that's why the shaitan knows to attack the heart if he can get the heart disconnected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If he can get the heart disconnected from the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then he is winning that battle. And that is why even when we look at our behavior and interpersonal relationships, we often think that they are simply about our behaviors. Well, this person is just a rude person. This person is just an angry person. This person is just a, is just a, they're just a mean person. Well, there's a lot that goes, there's a lot to that. There's a lot going on internally. Someone who is a quote unquote angry person is not just an angry person. There's something going on internally that makes them react in anger. That is the heart. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put success in the purification of the heart. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا The one who has purified it, their nafs, their soul, their heart, has become successful. وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا But the one who has debased their soul, they have their heart, they have not paid any attention to it, they put it aside, and this is the person who has truly failed. So in these brief moments, inshaAllah ta'ala, in this Jum'ah khutbah, I want to speak to you about one of the issues of the heart. And that is assumptions. Good assumptions and bad assumptions. And I know that we understand as Muslims part of our moral code is that we give other people the benefit of the doubt. That we have good assumptions. We refrain from giving bad assumptions. We understand that. But how much of that do we apply into our daily lives? Who amongst us can say that my first reaction towards someone is a reaction of making excuses for them, assuming the best, finding some positive understanding of what happened? And you know the thing about assumptions is, we all for ourselves, we always want other people to assume the best in us. There's not a single person who doesn't want that for themselves. We all want in our lives that if someone sees something from us, or we say something, or we do something, that the people around us, whether it be our community, whether it be our families, whether it be our spouse, whether it be our children, whether it be our friends, we all want for ourselves that people give us the benefit of the doubt. And when someone doesn't, we get offended. We would say to them, why did you think of this? Why did you think of me in this manner? Don't you know me? Why wouldn't you give me the benefit of the doubt? But when it comes to giving other people the benefit of the doubt, our minds get clouded. Our hearts get clouded. You know, there's a statement of this, of a, a famous statement that's been attributed to a few different scholars, and that is a statement that you should give 70 excuses. We've all heard this, right? Oh, 70 excuses. And that's almost like, it's a, it's a, it's a fun, it's a cool thing to say, right? Oh, 70 excuses. How many of us have once in our lives given an individual 70 excuses? I don't care who it is. Your mother, your father, your grandparents, someone who you love dearly. When was the last time you gave them 70 excuses before thinking something not so good of them? 70 when was the last time we gave them 50 excuses? When was the last time we gave them 40 excuses? When was the last time we gave them 10 excuses? Well, why sometimes we have a difficulty coming up with five excuses for our brother or our sister. And then we say to ourselves, there is no positive. There is no positive interpretation of this. And the answer is because, and the reason is because we, our minds get clouded. We are overwhelmed with negativity. And so we can't. We can't think of a positive interpretation. We can't think that there is something 
positive that could be happening in this situation. But you know, if we flip the table, we turn the side, and we put ourselves in that situation, and that's one of the ways, by the way, to deal with that problem of negative assumptions, is to put yourself in their situation. Is to say, if I was in their situation, how would I want people to treat me? And by the way, this principle is a firm principle in Islam, and most religions actually have this principle as well. It's called the golden rule. Do unto others as you like to be done unto you, right? Kama tadinu tadan, right? Or as Prophet said, uh, um, none of you will truly believe, hatta yuhibba li akhihi ma yuhibbu li nafsi. That you won't truly believe until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. It's not just material possessions. It's also how you would like to be treated. How you would like people to think when they see something from you. And so, people in general, and I know there's people sitting here right now, thinking, we're thinking to ourselves, yeah, I, I know that he's talking about giving people the benefit of the doubt. I know he's talking about making excuses for people, and I think I do that. And the reality is, most of us probably do, until, until we are tested. In our normal everyday lives, when we're feeling happy, when we're feeling okay, when we're feeling well, someone does something, we, we always think positive. We, we, it's easier for us to think positive of them. We're having a good day, we're not stressed out, we're, we'll think positive of someone. But what happens on a difficult day? What happens on a day that we've had a tough day at work, or we've had a tough day at school, or we had an argument with our spouse, or we're having issues with our children, on that day, are we willing to give people the benefit of the doubt? And there's a one very simple test, an indication of whether we give people the benefit of the doubt or not. And that is how we behave on the road. Ask yourself, when someone cuts you off on the road, what do you think? Do we get upset and angry and we're like, this person could have killed me and so on and so forth? Or are we like, you know what? Maybe this person is has an emergency situation. Maybe they didn't realize what was going on. And that's why, by the way, one of the comedians, he once said, it's like a very interesting statement. He said, it's interesting how anyone on the road who is driving faster than you, you're like, this person's a maniac. Anyone driving slower than you, you're like, this person's a dummy, this person's an idiot, right? That's a negative assumption. Someone's driving slower than you, you're like, can you believe this guy, right? He's got nowhere to go, he's got nowhere to be. We gotta get some, get out of the way. But if that same person was driving fast, like, look at this maniac driving like an insane person. That's a negative assumptions, right? And that's what happens when our mind gets clouded and we're not, we are no longer able to give those good assumptions. The other thing I want to talk about is that's the first step. The first step is simply allowing yourself to think positively of someone, to come up with positive. Or, 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 or good assumptions. The second step, and this is very vital, is actually believing those assumptions. Because I know I said, you know, come up with 70 excuses, come up with a list of excuses, and I know people would say, you know what, I'll take you on on that challenge. Here are 50, 70 excuses. But how many of those excuses are you willing to believe? Because if you don't believe that excuse, then it doesn't mean much. It's simply just an activity that you go through that does nothing for us. But the idea is to not only give a positive assumption, it is to believe that assumption. Or to understand that just because I don't see the full picture, there must be something, there must be something positive going on here. And the reason why I say this is because when it comes to conflict, which is part of our lives, one of the quickest ways to resolve conflict, anyone who has ever done any type of marriage counseling can tell you this. One of the quickest ways to resolve any type of conflict, especially interpersonal conflict, is for one or both of the parties to give the other party the benefit of the doubt. That quickly diminishes the conflict. And on the other hand, if you want to exacerbate the conflict, if you want to make it worse, then all you have to do is have one or both of the parties give the person or not be willing to give the person the benefit of their doubt. 
This is the person who says, I know this is what they meant by, the, by what they said. I know they meant me wrong, and I know they meant harm. Because once a person believes that, it is very difficult to move past that point. And so if you look at the conflicts that you may have in your life, then ask yourself, if I truly care about this, con if I truly care about this relationship and this person that I may be in conflict with, have I allowed myself to unclutter my mind, to unclutter my thoughts, whether it be the shaitan, right? That's why the Prophet ﷺ taught us to say, "A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim." When things are going insane, when things are not making sense, we say, "A'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim." We seek refuge in Allah from the accursed shaitan. We cut off those negative feelings. We cut off those negative thoughts. We put them aside because we want a clear mind to say something that will actually be, be beneficial. If you've ever found yourself in an argument, a lot of times we just keep talking. We keep saying things without even thinking about the implications of what we're about to say. The Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا غَضِبَ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلْيَسْكُتْ He said, if one of you gets angry, then Remain silent, be silent, stop talking. Give yourself a moment to consider what's going on in the situation. If we're angry, if we're upset, and we keep speaking, then those are going to be words of anger. That's not going to come to some type of solution. Even when it comes to parents dealing with their children, and you know, I'm a new father myself, my son is about two years old. <laughs> And I've had, to physic I've had to train myself to go through this. A lot of times when parents yell at their kids, it's not to elicit some positive behavior out of their kids. That yelling takes place because that's what they need for themselves to feel better. Because in most cases, yelling at a child, especially an infant child or a toddler, when you yell at a two-year-old, they don't see what you're saying. All they see all they take in from that is this person yelling and screaming. And they begin to believe that that is normal behavior. And that's when what psychologists call the cycle of violence starts. Where do, we, where, are these, where do these bad habits come from? Well, a lot of them are learned behaviors. A child who grows up in an environment where he sees his mom or his dad or his parents yelling at one another all the time. They see that the way their parents deal with conflict is to yell at one another, is to belittle one another, is to put each other down. Then the child learns that, yeah, you know what? This is how you deal with conflict. And so our actions have an implication way beyond our personal self. They have an implication in society as a whole. And that is why in the beginning of this khutbah, I said that the battle starts in the heart. If the hearts don't change, then how can we expect society to change? If, the hearts, if our heart doesn't change, how can we expect people's behaviors to change? And I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify and correct our hearts. Allahumma ameen. Aqulu qawli hadha. Astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Astaghfiruhu inna hu qawla qawla. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وسيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد uh, I know it's a little tight in here so if we could move up إن شاء الله there's some people waiting at the doors to make room for them إن شاء الله uh, move up and sit close my brothers and sisters Islamically according to our Islamic mor morals and our Islamic code the default of human beings is good and not bad. Right? We don't have this concept that some other cultures and faiths have of the original sin. Or that mankind is born sinful. That we're naturally evil and we need to change ourselves unless, we, unless something else happens. We're just naturally evil or bad beings. Islamically, we believe that people are by nature good. And that is why the Prophet ﷺ describes this. He described the fitrah. He said, Kullu mawlud al yuladu ala al fitrah. He said, Every newborn child is born upon their fitrah, their natural inclination towards good. And then he said, It is the outward influences, maybe their parents or this or that, that may change that fitrah. And so there is a principle that we have, and that is 
the default state of a human being is good and not bad. And if we approach life in that way, if we approach the people in that way, then our interaction and behavior with people would change. If we were to able, if we were to be able to sympathize and empathize with other people, then our behavior would vastly change. And that's why studies are now showing us that if you want to get people to help others, don't just talk to them about the problem. Show them the problem. Have them feel the problem. Right. For example, with what's going on in Syria right now, with our brothers and sisters over there, I know we all feel the pain. That's part of our iman. It's part of being Muslim. Yes, we feel the pain of our brothers and sisters. But the closer you are to someone, obviously you're going to feel it more. The more empathy you have, the more you're going to feel it. If you really want to feel what it's like, then go speak to a refugee. Go shake the hand of a refugee. Go hug a refugee that has been through this torment. And then you will feel more <coughs> closer. You will feel closer to you. You'll have more empathy. And you'll be more willing to help. And even though this is seemingly a lesser issue, the issue of good assumptions and bad assumptions, a lot of that goes back to empathy. Do we have the ability to empathize with other people, to try and feel what they're feeling? Some psychologists call this emotional empathy, being able to feel what they're feeling. Right. When you're in a conflict, we're in a conflict with someone, and someone's yelling at us, or they're angry at us, instead of looking at just what they're saying, are we able to look at the way they're feeling? Because a lot of times people will say something in an argument, but that, what they're saying, what they're verbalizing, is not related to what they're feeling in their heart. And if you're able to empathize in what they're feeling, that could resolve that conflict. And a lot of times, like I said, the shaitan convinces us that we know the absolute truth. That we know that this person meant bad for us. Or we know what they, what, exactly what they meant to say. And matters get vastly more complicated when we deal with the online world. Because we can't even hear inflection in people's voice, in their tone. Right? We don't even know what they, it's a written sentence. And a lot of times we'll draw conclusions that we want to draw. I'll give you one example. There's a sentence that has seven words in it. Depending on which word you emphasize, you can get seven different meanings out of the sentence. I never said she stole my money. Okay? What does that mean? I never said she stole my money. Well, let's look at how, what that would mean if we emphasize a different word. I never said that she stole my money. Meaning, I didn't say it, somebody else said I never said that she stole my money. Meaning it didn't happen. Never did it happen. I never said she stole my money. Meaning it was someone else, but not her. I never said she stole my money. I never said she stole it, she borrowed it, whatever took it, but I never said she stole it. I never said she stole my money. Meaning what? It wasn't my money that was stolen, somebody else's money. I never said she stole my money. Meaning what? She stole something else. Not my money, but something else. SubhanAllah. This one sentence, made up of seven words, can be interpreted in seven different ways. And a person who is not looking to purify their heart, a person who is not trying to block out the whisperings of the shaitan, a person who is not giving the person the benefit of the doubt, they can get whatever conclusion they want out of this sentence. How is it possible for us to then be sure when we interact with people that they meant this or they meant that? And if someone has said something to you, then maybe just go ask them. Right? And that, 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 that art of communication is almost lost today. Right? People say things, we take them in a certain way, they take them in a certain way, and conflict erupts. We're not willing to give people the benefit of the doubt. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, اجتنبوا كثيرا من الظن Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, avoid assumptions. Avoid making a lot of assumptions. إِنَّ بَعْضُ الظَّنِّ إِثَمْ 
Because part of these assumptions is sinfulness. I mean, if we keep going down that path, the path of making assumptions about people, then eventually we're going to end up in sin. And this leads these people down a dangerous, dangerous path. Sometimes it starts with assumptions. Then we start talking to other people about it. Then rumors start spreading. Then backbiting starts occurring. Then the community splits apart. Families split, split apart. Relationships split apart. All because a person didn't work upon their heart. And so as we work to become better Muslims and closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with our worship, our ibadah, it is important that we purify our hearts as well. It is important that we work upon, take that spiritual journey as well. And that is why, subhanAllah, if you look at the da'wah of the Prophet said them, he worked on people's hearts before the rulings of Islam came down, before the five daily prayers became obligated, before Hajj and Umrah became obligated, became, before charity became obligated, before fasting became obligated, the Prophet ﷺ was purifying the people's hearts. He was reminding them of their mortality. He was reminding people that they're not going to live forever. That there's going to be a reckoning. There's going to be a day of judgment. A day on which we are all going to be held accountable for what we do and what we did. And what did that do that cleansed and purified the hearts of the people? Well, they started looking at life in a different way. It was no longer about just the day-to-day -day and just the worldly stuff. It became something bigger. And at that point, when the rulings came down 13 years into the da'wah of the Prophet 13 years after the message was revealed, iqra, recite, 13 years after that, the rulings start to come down of prayer and fasting and so on and so forth, we know how that generation ended up. Khair al-Quruni Qadli, the best of generations is my generation. There is a reason why that generation was spiritually so very strong. is because they had the Prophet to guide them through that spiritual journey. So my call, inshallah ta'ala, my brothers and sisters, is that beginning today, as you start focusing on getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I believe every Friday, every day of Jum'ah, every prayer that you attend is, oppor is an opportunity for you to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I know that there are people sitting here today in this masjid today, right now, at 1.30 p.m. who have made the decision already and they're like, you know what? My life needs to change. I need more purpose. I need more meaning in my life. My life needs to mean something. And I need to figure out the purpose of my creation. I need to start addressing my spiritual needs. And I know there's people who make that decision on Fridays. And I know we look down upon you know, the congregation sometimes as a whole and say, oh, all these people come to Jum'ah every weekend, every Friday, and nothing happens. And it's easy to be negative. But we don't know what's happening in people's hearts. We don't know how hard their hearts are changing. And we know that true change comes from the heart. إن الله لا يغير ما بقوم من حتى يغير ما بأنفسهم. الله لا يغير the status of a people until they change what is within themselves, their heart and their souls. I ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to purify our hearts. I ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to bind us and to bring us closer as a ummah. I ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to bring relief to all of those who are suffering around the world. I ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to bring relief to our brothers and sisters in Syria and to bring relief to the city of Aleppo. I ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to bring relief and help to all the corners of the earth. Allahumma amin. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless this community as well and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to be agents of change within ourselves so that we, we may be positive members of the society as well. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu inna Allah ya'murukum bil adli wal ihsani wa ita'adhi al-qurba wa yanha al fahshai wal munkari wal baghi ya'idhukum la'allakum tathakkaroon fathkuruhu yazburukum wa shkuruhu yazidkum wa la dhikrullahi akbar Allahu ya'lamu ma tasna'oon kurri salatikum ya'amu